Please note today's session is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you very much. On behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to the February Advanced Topics and Implementation Science webinar. We are excited for a great series of DCCP DCCPS chats in 2018, but before we get started, a brief word about logistics. We ask that if you are not already on mute, to please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As mentioned, the session is being recorded and muting all lines will help us to avoid any background noise. We encourage questions. They can be submitted using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Please type your question into the provided Q&A field and hit submit. Feel free to submit your questions at any time, but we'll be moving through your questions and some we have for our guests throughout today's webinar. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone who is joining us. Uh, for folks who are joining us for the first time, the Advanced Topics webinars started out as an opportunity for us to extend upon some of the in-person trainings that we've been uh, doing to delve into more specific topics. And so uh, we invited various speakers who gave more traditional talks. Uh, about a year or so ago, we uh, thought that, and, and actually credit Sarah uh, for, uh, for really pioneering this, we thought that shifting our attention to more of the fireside chat, you'll see uh, FDR there, um, as, as inspiration, and really getting a chance not only to hear from experts within the field, but also to have as much interaction and as much discussion from uh, those of you uh, who are tuning in to ask the questions that you have. Initially, it was around specific topics within implementation science, um, and over time, we've tried to use the same kind of format uh, for a broader set of discussions around the interface of implementation science and uh, healthcare and uh, population health and research overall. Uh, and so this, uh, th this particular webinar kicks off a relatively new uh, series for us, which is thinking about the integration of implementation science within our broader cancer control and population sciences field. Uh, and so within our team's strategic plan, we've talked about advancing the science of implementation. We've talked about various ways in which we've tried to bring together researchers practitioners and policymakers, and the third plank of our strategic plan is really thinking about contextualizing implementation science within the broader cancer research community. Uh, and so we are very happy to start this off uh, with, and there you see uh, our, our photos uh, taken maybe a, a few years ago, <laughs> um, but you know, uh, we're very grateful to, to start this off with uh, Bob Croyle, uh, who as many of you know is the director of our Division of Cancer Control Population Sciences. Uh, at the NCI. Uh, I can tell you as someone who had spent a, a fair amount of time at a different institute within the NIH, uh, many of us around the NIH had always uh, admired not only the division but Bob's leadership of it as a real testament to how um, extramural divisions can both be generative of scientific uh, products internally but can also uh, lead the field, lead the extramural community. And so it was, a, it was a great honor when I had the opportunity to join that division and to work uh, for Bob um, over uh, just uh, three years ago. Um, so uh, with Bob here, we wanted to delve into a discussion, first contextualizing cancer control population sciences and how Bob has seen that uh, move over time, and then specifically talking about the integration of implementation science within the division's mandate and the broader uh, community. Uh, so thank you very much, Bob, for joining us. Happy to be here. Great. And uh, just to, to forecast, and you'll see a, a lovely uh, a lovely image of both uh, the day, which is Valentine's Day, as some of you may know, uh, and uh, our efforts to try and bring that fire spirit to the proceedings. Um, we wanted to start out by, uh, you know, first by uh, giving a few questions uh, to Bob, shaping some of the background context. But as Sarah had said, encourage those of you uh, who, would, who have questions for Bob uh, for us to discuss, to bring that into the discussion. So we'll be monitoring that. Um, but just to start things off, Bob, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, your own career progression and how you started in academia, moved to the NCI, and then uh, you know, a little bit about the progression of how you ultimately took on and have uh, uh, thrived in, in the role of DCCPS director. Sure. Uh, thanks, David, for hosting this. Um, and, and hello to everybody on the line. Uh, great to participate in this. Uh, well, I, I um, started out uh, very traditionally uh, as an individual level focused researcher. So uh, my PhD is in social psychology. So my training was largely uh, at the individual and interpersonal and group level, uh, less so at the population level. Uh, I spent 15 years in academia, went through all the regular steps, starting out as an assistant professor and then uh, ultimately a, a tenured full professor, 
uh, before moving to NCI. And I moved to NCI when uh, Barbara Reimer was the original direct, division director and the division was just being created, uh, first on a piece of paper and then through NCI reorganization and then after that through a lot of additional uh, recruitment. Um, and originally joined NCI as associate director for the new behavioral research program. Uh, and so uh, spent a good bit of time uh, setting up new branches, hiring staff, uh, developing new initiatives, uh, a number of new RFAs. Uh, and then when Barbara went back to North Carolina to UNC, uh, then I was appointed uh, division director. Um, and so since then, really kind of uh, starting off on a really great foundation that Barbara and her deputy Bob Hyatt laid in terms of division initiatives and expansion in this area. Uh, and then really got engaged with implementation science uh, in that context. And I should say that, you know, early on, uh, in those early years at NCI, uh, dissemination research or implementation science research at NIH was a speck of sand on the beach. It was, uh, there were a few uh, early adopters, uh, true believers. Uh, and I should say that you know, David, uh, when he was at NIMH, was one of our first co-conspirators on developing the field. Uh, so this was initially when John Kerner was our deputy director in this area, and then after that, Russ Glasgow. Um, and uh, so it's, and, and it's been uh, a, a steady but bumpy and long road. But right now, uh, I can say that, you know, much more broadly across our agency, NIH, uh, you see more widespread acceptance, support, and interest in the implementation science. Great. Um, can, if we can take a, a sort of look at the broader field of cancer control and population sciences, obviously, as you said, you've been uh, basically present from the, from the foundation of this division and then, of course, uh, at the helm for, for a, a significant period of time. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, cancer control population sciences has changed over the years uh, while you've been at NCI? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, the kind of number of domains that we work in, the number of disciplines involved has expanded a lot. And a lot of that uh, comes from advances in basic science, clinical science, uh, population science research generally. Uh, you know, a lot of the upstream driver, what we do is epidemiological research. And uh, at the time that we were starting to develop implementation science, it coincided with the time that there were just a lot of steady advances in the development of omics fields, disciplines, and technologies. Uh, so initially genomics, uh, genome-wide association studies, molecular epi, but more recently the metabolomics, work on the microbiome, et cetera. Uh, so the, the kind of the, the content or sub substantive scientific content areas of cancer control population science research has evolved and expanded. Initially it was, uh, you know, really focused a couple of decades ago on mammography screening, uh, tobacco control, uh, and uh, dietary intervention. Um, more, those, those areas are still going strong, but I think now uh, we see, uh, you know, public health genomics, uh, we see uh, implementation of evidence uh, across all levels, not just individual group or organizational. Uh, and then I think one of the things where we've really evolved is uh, toward a much greater integration between research, cancer control, and policy. Uh, so we support more policy research than we used to, uh, but also I think we are more uh, appreciative of the need to develop systems uh, for advancing evidence into practice as well. Great. Um, and, you know, you mentioned uh, John Kerner as, as the initial uh, deputy director. Can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you first became aware of and, and interested in implementation science? How did that first come to the division? Yeah, it was really, uh, I think, caring from my experience working at two cancer centers previously, uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and then Huntsman Cancer Institute after that. So before I moved to NCI, I was involved with NCI-supported work of both, you know, R01 grants, but also some of the larger projects. That's when the commit trial was just getting off the ground. There, were a lot, there was a lot of discussion in the cancer control community broadly about moving interventions to the community level. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about the need to grow the evidence base, and then and a lot of debate about uh, what level of evidence is required to take something into the clinic or into the public health program or policy domain. So uh, that was probably most well-developed in, in tobacco control, 
Uh, and so that field, in a sense, had a much longer head start and many more people involved in it. Obviously, it's such a high priority for cancer control. Uh, but I think what's, what's exciting more recently in implementation science is that as its own field, it's developed significantly uh, methodologically, conceptually, uh, the development of consensus definitions. So, so as, as a scholarly field that's linked to public health, uh, I think that's been an exciting development. And then also it's, it's a field where uh, our own area of focus, cancer control, has had but still has a lot to learn from other areas of prevention and public health. Uh, and so that's always one of our, my concerns too is, is preventing people from getting too siloed in their problem domain that they study and ensuring that there's you know, generalizable principles and models and measures that uh, we be both import to cancer control but also as we develop our own field that we export uh, to other disciplines. Great, and, and do you have a sense um, of, or, you know, ha has there been any changes in the way in which uh, implementation science has been considered, discussed, um, you know, within the division, but also potentially uh, in your discussions with folks within the field, in your discussions with, um, you know, with other divisions or, or other institutes or other agencies? Uh, how has, uh, how have the discussions that you've been involved in related to implementation science within uh, you know, within within the division, the, the institute, the agency, et cetera, uh, changed over, over that time period? Yeah, you know, I, there, I think one thing that's changed is that across the institutes at NIH, there's a greater comfort level uh, in terms of allocating resources, time and effort, uh, you know, grant funding in implementation science. Uh, part, of, part of the uh, anxiety about the field or uncertainty or debate within the agency Initially, it was really about you know what are the appropriate boundaries between what NIH supports and what CDC supports. Uh, that was kind of a simplistic version of the debate uh, a few years ago, but that's really evolved because I think um, you know as we've seen most recently in the, in the opiate drug abuse epidemic, um, there's been so many recent examples of salient examples of what happens when you don't know how to get evidence into practice, if you have an anticipated dissemination implementation, uh, if you don't take into account uh, what's the capacity of primary care or local uh, and state public health uh, to address a problem. And I think there's been uh, pressure from Congress over the last few years for NIH to play a greater role. So, but this, this issue about what's the appropriate mission boundary of NIH is ongoing. Uh, and it changes a little bit every time there's a new NIH director, every time there's a new administration. But I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot of the uh, members of Congress who strongly support NIH uh, do so not only because they strongly support basic science, which, which they clearly do, and they, and they support NIH's role in, in providing evidence that's utilized by the pharmaceutical industry, but I think uh, there's a greater appreciation that um, in population science, uh, NIH has a unique niche and role that complements what CDC does. Great. Um, at this point, again, just want to encourage folks to, uh, as questions or, or thoughts come up, uh, feel free to chat, uh, to, to enter them into the chat or Q&A chat or Q and A features as we are tracking those and are happy to integrate those into the, uh, into the conversation. Uh, while we're waiting for those, I wanted to ask, uh, as you're as you're thinking about the the days ahead, uh, any thoughts you have about key next steps that that this group should be thinking about where uh, implementation science and cancer control and population sciences are concerned? Well, I think when there's a field that's kind of still in an early phase of development like implementation science, uh, one of the challenges is to is is the development of theoretical conceptual models that then get utilized by uh, individuals planning and proposing research, for example, you know, in a grant application to the NIH. Um, I mean, you saw, you see this in the field of public health and health behavior generally, you know, uh, dating back to the 1950s when the health belief model was developed. And then there was a period of time when, you know, everybody proposed grants applying the health belief model. And then over time, people said, well, gee, this is awfully limited and uh, needs to be replaced or modified or enhanced. And so you saw a more uh, sophisticated development of models 
both some of them context specific, uh, some of them problem specific, but you know generally more sophisticated uh, and more comprehensive. And and I think the same thing's happening in implementation science is that you know a, a few years ago it would have been acceptable to say, well, this is a new area. I don't really have a strong conceptual framework. I'm making up my own terms. I'm generating my own definitions, and I'm I, I'm off and running. Uh, and I think what's what's really changed from that first phase is the initial development of models like like the REA model, which has been so influential. But but more recently, uh, a lot of discussion among organizations and disciplines to develop uh, additional models and theoretical work that provides a framework for implementation science projects. And I think that, I think that's key within the NIH system because when the NIH peer review system peer reviewers uh, want to know not only what the hypothesis is and how you're going to test it, but what your conceptual framework is and what, what the foundation and rigor of that framework is. So uh, theory-derived theory hypothesis testing and hypothesis testing that contributes to and advances theory is uh, that, that second phase that I think we're right in the middle of in implementation science. So it's an exciting time because for both junior and senior investigators, there's a lot of room to introduce completely novel new ideas and frameworks and, and study designs. At the same time, if you're new to the field, uh, just from the last couple of years, there's a, a, a just proliferation of the research literature in this area that you can take advantage of uh, that just didn't exist 10 years ago. And actually, uh, one, one of the questions that has just come in was asking, uh, almost virtually on, on the back of what you just said, as someone new to the field, uh, where's the best place to start to learn the correct methods? And so um, I, we'd encourage, certainly, if there's any, any specifics that you, that, that you would want to amplify if we're, if we're not getting the spirit of the question. But as, as Bob has said, you know, over, over recent years, we didn't used to have a journal called Implementation Science, which was a natural place for people to publish not only the outcomes of their studies, but the protocols, so laying out what are the specific methods um, for those who have had a chance uh, and, and we welcome more of you uh, to attend the annual dissemination implementation science meetings that the NIH has run with Academy Health, with AHRQ, with PCORI, et cetera. There's also a lot of exposure along with technical assistance workshops to, again, think about what you're interested in and what are the right methods um, and, and various training programs. Uh, those of you in the cancer space, uh, you know, may know that we had just announced and are in the process of of um, you know launching uh, the first training institute for dissemination and implementation research in cancer, uh, and we're we're gratified to see the the response to that. Um, but as Bob has said, I think in the past we might not have had as many resources at our disposal. Uh, Sarah and and the rest of the team have have worked hard to make sure that as many resources that we can provide are on our. Uh, implementation science website at NCI, uh, but of course, if you have uh, if you have more specific questions about things uh, you know that, that you're looking for, uh, definitely let us know because it's been really great to see that we can capitalize on on the good work that all of you uh, and others have done. Um, I wanted uh, to to see if you uh, had an, and thanks by the way to folks who are already uh, putting in questions. Keep them coming, um, Bob. I wonder if if uh, beyond sort of theoretical uh, advances and opportunities that go along with that. Are there other priority areas for research that, you know, from your vantage point, you'd like to see our field undertake? Yeah, well, so I think one, one theme, uh, you know, and this is, this is not anything new. It's, it's been a classic theme in IS for some time. But in cancer control, uh, you know, we're constantly tracking all of our incidence mortality data. So one of the important roles we have in our group uh, for the nation is the aggregation, the collection and aggregation of surveillance data of all kinds. So incidence, mortality, behavioral risk factors, uh, and our IS team and surveillance team together have just put out, just launched our latest edition of our Cancer Trends Progress Report. Uh, so if you haven't seen the CTPR, the Cancer Trends Progress Report, so for folks on the web portal, I'm going to go ahead and link that in the chat while Bob finishes telling us about it. Nice. Okay. Uh, so the CTPR uh, is kind of our landscape analysis of surveillance and monitoring data on cancer control from a lot of different sources, and it's intended to be kind of an easy one-stop shop for all of you 
uh, to find how you know, how our progress is, and we kind of map this against healthy people goals of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, but but you know, but as we've tracked those last couple of years, we're always kind of uh, have our eye out for trends, for changes, what's getting best, better, what's getting worse. And as many of you have seen from other uh, venues or presentations we've done, uh, one of the domains that's getting worse is the urban-rural disparity in cancer mortality. And, uh, and it's not everywhere in the country. Uh, it's especially focused in some regions like, like the southern U.S. Um, because uh, clearly there are high-income rural counties. You know, if, you're, if you have an eight-bedroom lodge in Aspen, Colorado, we wouldn't say you're terribly underserved, uh, especially if you've got your private helicopter and the helipad. But, uh, but, but, it, but I think that's one example and one of the themes when we looked across some of the different disparity areas that are persistent uh, in cancer control in particular uh, really are relevant to the issue of reach. Uh, and that is uh, we've built a fabulous network of 69 NCI designated cancer centers and about 70% of all of our research funding goes through those cancer centers. Uh, and we know that there's incredible esoteric treatment going on there oftentimes very expensive treatment. Uh, and the, the, this it's kind of differentiation between people who are enrolled in a trial at an NCI center versus somebody who's living in a rural community uh, where there's few, if any, primary care physicians, let alone specialty physicians. Uh, we know there's a, a steady uh, epidemic of closures of rural hospitals and clinics. Uh, especially in those states that did not expand Medicaid, uh, additional cha challenges. Uh, and, and so REACH, the issue of REACH, which is a classic IS theme, touches upon a, a lot of domains, uh, quality of cancer care, uh, who gets cancer screening, uh, who has access to evidence-based cessation programs, um, what, what kind of follow-up to initial screening that might be done in a primary care context. Uh, and so this issue of REACH has really been discussed as, as a hot topic across the, our whole department right now, not just in our agency, but URSA, HRQ, CDC, CMS, uh, because, uh, you know, all of all the proliferation of geospatial work in the last few years that's been published, uh, you know, mapping cancer incidence and mortality and risk factors. And so when you see, that, see, see how much geography accounts for variation, and that illustrates this challenge of reach. Uh, and you know, traditionally, uh, people have discussed this in the context of leveraging technology, and we're still absolutely involved in that, you know, telemedicine, whatever. But as in many areas of implementation science, uh, the problems aren't simple or singular. Similarly, the, the solutions are complex and multi-level. Uh, so we see the need to grow the evidence base related to reach, uh, not only in rural populations, but others. And uh, we've already announced some significant new partnerships with other federal agencies, uh, one with the Federal Communications Commission in terms of enhancing broadband infrastructure and access. Uh, that's, that's the launch project um, that was recently announced. Uh, in a lot of the new legislation and appropriations that are coming through Congress, you're seeing a lot of language and, in some cases, money and resources towards enhancing things like telemedicine infrastructure. Uh, and, but this also relates to payment issues at CMS. It also relates to uh, workforce issues. Uh, and then for us, uh, in our role as a research funder, um, it also relates to the fact that we, we want to grow our research portfolio in this domain. About 15% of the U.S. population is rural, but only about 3% of our grant portfolio focuses on rural populations. So that's, that's one example I'd use for how we kind of go back and forth between looking at data and trends to then prioritizing cancer control initiatives. Yeah, and, and of course, um, you know, Bob mentioned the, the spotlight on, on rural cancer control and, and even in, in upcoming uh, past meetings and, and upcoming meetings that, that the division is engaged in, and also uh, just referencing the cancer moonshot, that one of the overarching themes across all of the recommendations was the attention uh, to research that can reduce or eliminate disparities overall and seeing 
uh, disparities in rural populations being uh, sort of chiefly underrepresented in our historical portfolio. Yeah, I think a lot of these areas too, one of the things we found in talking to other agencies in the federal government is one of the things they've asked us to do is to try to eliminate what they perceive to be myths in our research community that we work with. So a lot of local rural providers, for example, have interacted with academic institutions, you know, faculty and schools of public health, cancer centers, et cetera, and they, they don't feel well understood. Um, and they've kind of asked for our help in terms of rethinking the kind of research we support. And, and they don't use the word implementation science, but really oftentimes what they're talking about is implementation science because they say, well, you know, we have challenges. You know, we know, we know there's reviews and evidences, meta-analyses and best practices that CDC puts out, but that not, doesn't necessarily answer my question in terms of what to do at a local level. And, uh, and they want to participate in research partnerships, but, you know, they have a lot of burdens, they have limited time, resources, and so research partnerships that don't interfere with the day-to-day -day business of providing care at a critical access hospital or in a rural population is really what they're working for. And so in our parlance, you know, we would talk about feasibility. We talk, they're, they're extremely concerned about sustainability. Uh, and, um, and, and they, they feel uh, that our constituency uh, can benefit from training in, in these domains. And so that's why we're really attuned and, and welcome your input on training needs because this is, as David said, this is really one of the ways where we've tried to participate within our larger agency to build this field. So I'm gonna jump in again and just remind folks, thank you if you've already submitted questions. Again, you can do so using the chat or the Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen. And for those looking for more resources, the CTPR report, a link to the launch initiative and a link to more from NCI and Dr. Coyle on rural cancer, a blog is all available for you in the chat. So I'm gonna turn it back over to David and Bob. Awesome, thank you very much. And uh, in the spirit of, uh, of rewarding those who have taken that plunge and typed in that question, I'm gonna to get to uh, the next question that, that was submitted. Um, and uh, there's a more specific vent to it, but maybe to ask the more general uh, version, Bob, to you, and then maybe I can take a, a little bit more specific part of it. Um, and that's to say, as you look across the division, what do you see more broadly as the role for qualitative research and researchers uh, in, uh, in cancer control pop sci. Yeah, so I think we've long recognized that, you know, qualitative research is an essential component and uh, for contributing to knowledge in, in all cancer control domains. And what we hear over and over and over and over and over again is oftentimes it comes down to issues of review. Uh, and so we constantly try to monitor this because if you have a qualitative research proposal and there aren't qualitative experts or methodologists to review your application, uh, that's a, an issue and, and we recognize that. And for those of you who said that to us, we hear you loud and clear. And that's something we work with the you know, Center for Scientific Review and the NCA Review folks on. Uh, also, um, one of the other thing that we've heard over the years too is, is it'd be helpful to develop uh, resources, white papers, or uh, I wouldn't say guidelines in the formal sense, but helping qualitative researchers navigate the process, uh, funding opportunities, funding in general, but also how to align this with uh, NCI priorities. And so maybe I'll ask David to talk about uh, one activity related to this in IS that Susan Horton Roberts has taken the lead on in terms of uh, qualitative research support. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'll, I'll, I'll start with that and then, and then go a little bit broader. And, and so uh, Susan has, has pulled together a, a group of experts uh, in, in qualitative research methods to ask those questions about what are the best ways to use uh, qualitative research toward answering uh, a range of questions in implementation science. Uh, so that group, which uh, has been uh, referred to as QualRIS, I think WALRIS with a Q, um, has been hard at work and, and is in the final stages of uh, a white paper, which hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to make available uh, in, the, in the next few months, 
that walks through a whole range of methods, really tries to think not just about traditional methods, but how are qualitative methods evolving over time and how can they best be used in different cases of, of answering uh, implementation science questions. Um, so so that, that would be a, a clear indication of how important we see it. I think it's also worth noting that within the Dissemination and Implementation Research and Health Standing Study section at the Center for Scientific Review, there's long been an appreciation and actually expertise uh, among the standing members of that committee uh, in qualitative research and, and certainly more in, in, in mixed methods as well. And so I would say in the past, I remember attending different review meetings where people just weren't even aware that there are qualitative methods that could be used to answer questions through to it's shifting to the other side, which says we really need to make sure that there's qualitative research expertise on any study that is proposing qualitative methods. So it's not just we tack on a particular component and we say it's mixed methods, but really thinking about how do we use the strongest possible qualitative research methods to answer the relevant questions. And for that, your question about the role for qualitative researchers is that we absolutely need them, we need you, to make sure that you can lend that expertise to these studies. So I think it's really shifted from how could this relate now to how do we make sure that these methods are optimized? And I think that was the spirit of the QualRIS uh, working group that, that has, has been, uh, you know, uh, racing toward, toward a conclusion of that, of that first bit. Um, and, and where we want to go. Yeah, I think and, and if, you're, if you're a qualitative researcher who is new to implementation science or considering doing work in implementation science, I guess I'd, I'd really encourage you to pursue that direction because the IS field and what, you know, whether you, you're talking about the meetings, the journals, the funders, it, it is a, a welcome, you, you will have a welcome home in the IS field. Uh, and when you look at the funders who have been really active at IS over the years, whether it's us or PCORI or Robert Wood Johnson or Academy Health, you know, in, 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 for, among the funders community that is very supportive of implementation science, uh, you know, the, the uh, value and acceptance of qualitative research is, is not an issue. Uh, and so it's one of the friendliest communities uh, for uh, qualitative research that I know of. Yeah. So one of our favorite questions is, is this session being recorded and archived? And so, yes, it is expected online a week or two after today. And also for those looking, Suzanne, I know you're on the line. I just volunteered your staff bio for folks looking for more about QualRIS. It's available in the chat. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. And, and so Bob alluded to this and, and the, the question alluded to this. Uh, we really do see implementation science as requiring teams, right? So it's teams of investigators from different perspectives, different areas of expertise, uh, teams in terms of the collaborations with folks who may not consider themselves researchers but need to be involved in shaping as well as understanding the, the uh, impact of, of, of various studies that are done. Um, so yeah, thanks for the question, and, and obviously we, we have a fair amount to say on it. Um, I, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, and, and thanks for, for, for continuing to submit questions, I wanted to ask more of a, a broad question that really uh, underscores what we see as the importance of these series of, of webinars looking at integration. And, and that's just some thoughts that you have. How, how do you see implementation science integrating within the sort of broad activities of, of the division? Well, I think one of the main things uh, that we focused on this last couple of years is leveraging the larger infrastructures, research infrastructure that NCX supports, you know, fo follow the money where the dollars go. And to what degree are those currently or not being fully leveraged uh, in implementation science? Uh, so obviously, cancer centers are one obvious starting point. Uh, and for those of you who work in a cancer center or, or interact with cancer center leaders, uh, we've been doing a number of targeted funding opportunities, uh, cancer center grant supplements in a variety of different areas, uh, HPV vaccination uptake, for example, uh, development of smoking cessation services uh, and scaling up cessation services to all cancer patients in a cancer center context. Uh, more recently, uh, work that we were funding on population catchment areas of cancer centers, how to define those, how to collect data, how to link from state to local to national uh, data and analyses. 
uh, and uh, and then more more recently uh, on on rural cancer control. Uh, so the, the 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 case I often make uh, within the NCI, you know, to our leadership and with my colleagues here, you know, as a funder, is that oftentimes we get a lot of bang for the buck by piggybacking projects, uh, by making sure that a research network that might be have been established for one purpose, uh, you know, studying, uh, you know, colorectal cancer screening could be leveraged and used for another purpose. And I think for implementation science, uh, that's key because oftentimes the traditional R01 grant that we fund, you know, the initial efficacy study, study uh, testing uh, a, a particular strategy, you know, to increase screening uptake or to support cancer survivors or to improve communication between patients and providers, um, the, the, the oftentimes lacks, you know, once the public, paper gets published, that there's a lack of a follow-on into the effectiveness or IS type studies that we want to see. And so the, the, the way to support that oftentimes um, is that collaboration of the upstream efficacy researcher with the downstream effectiveness and implementation researcher. And that may mean moving out of your own department, your own program, uh, and collaborating with colleagues that may not work in the cancer field at all. Uh, they may be working in drug abuse prevention or adolescent health, or they may be, uh, you know, implementing a opiate drug abuse uh, implementation program. But they're, they're, one of the things we've seen over and over, for example, in the rural health context, is there's a tremendous breadth of expertise out there that's not being utilized and leveraged in a lot of the specific domains of cancer control that we support. And so that's why David, David's points about partnerships are key, uh, because we hear from the local level, uh, as, as we just heard recently, some of our staff were visiting a rural health clinic, and people were crying out for us to support research that takes into account and measures and considers some of the local contextual factors and, and variables as we, as we would see them. That, that constrain or influence what they can and cannot do. Um, and uh, so we, we need to reduce, in a sense, the naivete of the, our, our academic research community uh, from a community perspective. Uh, and, and I think that's where, you know, that qualitative research that we are asking about can really fill in the knowledge gaps. Great. Uh, so another question that, that uh, has, has been submitted uh, talks about having qualitative data that uh, has, is exhibiting a gap in knowledge about recommended services for cancer patients, the eventual goal being to create an intervention to expand uptake. Uh, any suggestions on next steps in terms of building uh, that intervention? Well, I think, uh, the, you know, the, the partnerships with, with the non-research community, clearly I mentioned, are, are, are key. The other thing, too, is, is and what, once you get into the service and delivery domain, whether it's clinical services, or public health programs or services, um, it requires you to kind of immerse yourself and become knowledgeable about what is possible. Uh, so, so we see this challenge, especially with behavioral scientists who develop a very nice behavioral, behavioral medicine intervention, and then they come back to us and say, gee, I did all this work, I got the grant, I published the papers, now I've developed a service that nobody will pay for. Uh, and how would that project be different if at the get-go those investigators were thinking down the road, thinking ahead about implementation dissemination, and gee, you know, if we build it, will they come? And this this happens a lot in terms of the payment domain. So, you know, becoming a little bit familiar with, you know, how how does how does a service become coverable? How how does coverage generated within CMS or agencies like that, or how do insurance companies make decisions? Um, We've tried to incorporate this in some of our training programs, uh, and maybe David, you could say a word about the Sprint program, <laughs> which is really designed to, to kind of fill that void, uh, because we've got a lot of a lot of our uh, investigators that we fund say, look, I, I'm trying to do research. I, I, I developed an invention, I tested it, I've done it. Now, what do I do next, and whose job is it to take it to the next level? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, going back a, a, a few years uh, within the team, we were taught we 
uh, as, as folks may know, we have this uh, Research Tested Intervention Programs website, which Annabelle Wee uh, from our team uh, directs, and that's now 187, I think it is, uh, effective uh, cancer control interventions that are posted, and the goal is that we've provided them and then people will be able to take them and incorporate them uh, into our practice. And as we're thinking about uh, technology, we're thinking about different ways to try and expand the reach of those interventions. Uh, we had the opportunity to be a part of this HHS Ignite, this sort of innovation uh, program for, for those of us within the department. And the original goal was trying to say, how do we think about technology versions of those interventions? But what we were encouraged to do then is talk to your customers, go to the researchers and say, is that truly one of the challenges that you're seeing? Talk to uh, health plans, talk to the range of different people who are using these interventions, and is the problem technology or is it something more fundamental? One of the major things that came out of that project that we did was that we didn't really have a great way to try and guide people to help investigators in designing their interventions so that they could be effectively disseminated and implemented. And so there is a, a wonderful model that the National Science Foundation has created called i -Corps. Uh, which, uh, which Anna Gazinski and, and Cindy Vinson and April O oh were instrumental in adapting to behavioral interventions to coach people, to help investigators who are developing and testing those interventions to be thinking about how do we make sure that we know where this could go. If this study is wildly successful, it doesn't necessarily mean that all these people have access or it's even designed in a way that people could incorporate it into their practice. So what Bob's alluding to is Sprint, which is speeding research intervent tested interventions, um, is this training program that's now in its third cohort that gets people who are developing and testing those interventions to think more about the sort of broad marketplace, all of the factors that are going to affect whether that intervention can be as successful as possible. Yeah, so, so that's something to check out. Uh, all of it's linked on the chat bar, so that our TIPS program and the Sprint program are available for you in the chat box. Great, and if you, and if you, maybe you've talked to Sprint alums, and uh, it's been interesting because for a lot of uh, behavioral science or behavioral medicine intervention researchers, a lot of them have had a transformative experience when they've gone through this because it's really, you know, how do you develop a business model for this uh, effective intervention that you've developed? And uh, we're already seeing uh, amazing payoff and uptake in what otherwise would be interventions that live and die only in a journal article. Um, so this next question, I think, alludes to the idea that cancer control and population sciences may know no bounds. And so it asks, what are the channels for uh, of international collaboration, or how do you see um, the, the sort of uh, global side of, uh, of cancer control and population sciences? Yeah, so this has been a real uh, challenge for NCI because uh, when Harold Varmus became our director, he really uh, led an expansion of our global health activities under our Center for Global Health. And, uh, and, and so our global health programs, activities, whether it's training, meeting, workshops, uh, bilateral formal partnerships, uh, MOUs signed with other governments, um, you know, all, all this has really expanded and proliferated. Now we're kind of entering another phase, and that is how do, how do you prioritize all these? Because we are inundated with requests from other countries whether it's health ministries or cancer centers or public health officials uh, or, or in some cases prime ministers who want to collaborate in, in areas which, which we consider to be implementation science issues and questions. And so, how do you, so uh, without hiring another uh, thousand people at NCI to meet all these needs, how do we prioritize, how, how do we provide technical assistance? So, um, uh, and, and I think this is an ongoing debate in the cancer community among our cancer center directors. Uh, one of the things that we've done on the partnership thing is we've tried to build much stronger bridges between university centers or schools of global health or global studies. They go under different names and flavors and labels depending on which university you're affiliated with. But uh, we now annually convene leaders of global health centers in academia with our cancer centers leaders, and that's facilitated a, a lot of new partnerships. The, the second thing that we identified right off the bat uh, and uh, in, from our Center for Global Health was we, we and other funders were 
finding a lot of people to work in the same countries and they didn't know that their colleagues were there. So when we went through and inventoried, you know, who are all the people funded by NIH, for example, you know, working in Ghana, there were many, many different people that were doing very related but completely disconnected things. And obviously people in the countries uh, have had a wish, gee, I wish all these Americans would talk to each other, you know, because I just met with the guy from the Gates Foundation and then somebody from Bloomberg knocked on my door and then great to see the American Cancer Society here, NCI, NIH, NHLBI, on and on and on. So, so uh, this, this planning and coordination. And then the other thing was getting ground level experience on what the needs and concerns are. Uh, by and large, because we're a national organization, our, our, and most of what NCI does within the government is at a national level as opposed to state level health departments or a lot of the program CDC funds. We by and large deal with other countries, at, again, at a national level. Uh, and a lot, our intramural program has a very vast international reach. Our Division of Cancer Epidemiology works in dozens of countries all over the world. So there is researcher to researcher collaborations. But what we've also been doing in our own group is we've been uh, temporarily placing our own staff in foreign embassies. Uh, so right now we have two of our program directors uh, doing uh, embassy stints, one in Beijing, one in Poland. Um, and so that we have some focused kind of deep dives into cancer control collaborations at the country level and, we, and, and enhance our collaboration with the State Department. Uh, at the same time, uh, NCI has a strong relationship with the UICC and other international health organizations, WHO, uh, IR, for example. Uh, and, um, and, and a lot of this, you know, it's, it's part of it's through traditional mechanisms like research grants. Uh, a lot of people when we visit other countries learn that they don't even realize that NIH does fund grants to principal investigators in other countries. Uh, so NIH has, uh, and NCI has a, has a portfolio of, of P, principal investigator-led grants in other countries. But most of the most recent funding initiatives that our Center for Global Health has launched in the last couple of years have been partnership grants. Uh, uh, one, the typical one is, you know, partnership between an investigator here and an investigator in another country. And in several countries now, there's a growing number, uh, we've developed parallel funding mechanisms. So the first one we did was in China but there's the other countries that participate where, where, the, where, the, where, for example, the investigator in China applies through their funding agency uh, and, and the same application, the same grant goes through NIH peer review. And so there's parallel collaborative funding coming from both the U.S. and the foreign country. Uh, and so those parallel funding collaboration initiatives have been uh, steadily expanding. Uh, and, then, and then I'd also encourage a lot of you if you're interested in the global health domain or context, is uh, take a look online. Uh, we post the abstracts uh, of every grant we fund. If you go to our division website, there's a site that lists all of our international grants and projects. Uh, and because uh, we know there's a lot of students who get out or graduate students, pre-docs, post-docs, who want to do global work in cancer control, but they don't know how to get into it. And I think one of the best strategies is to reach out and talk to uh, funded investigators in our portfolio who are working in a foreign country and try to get a sense of what is required because it's often not fast. It requires a development of longer-term relationships. Uh, but uh, we're happy to help identify mentors, uh, currently funded projects, or uh, steer you to international organizations who have a lot of experience in that space. Yeah, the other thing, just to, just to piggyback on that, is, is with, within our uh, dissemination implementation research program announcements from the beginning of them, um, they've always been open to uh, work by, uh, conducted by international investigators as well as located in, you know, anywhere around the globe because there was a sense that we could learn a lot about implementation by taking into account the variety of different community settings, clinical settings, et cetera, that the, the, that the global nature of things uh, provides. Um, our training institutes that we've had have each and every year had uh, folks from uh, outside of the U.S., from varying different countries, and, and we would expect that the future ones would be uh, similar. Uh, our uh, 
sibling uh, center, the Fogarty International Center, has also run a number of international trainings uh, around implementation science. And even the annual meeting that some of you have, have attended, um, and others are welcome, uh, has a global implementation science track. So I think the, the, the fruits of your sort of international labors are, are great for us because I, we, we do feel like we can learn about implementation science everywhere. Um, but I think Bob's right in terms of trying to understand what are the different channels through which you can connect with people through there might be source, you know, through which there might be sources of funding that you wouldn't initially think about, uh, and then even just sharing experiences uh, in you know that that folks have had in, in uh, different settings. And NCI supports a lot of technology development work relevant to developing countries, low and middle income countries. If that's something you're interested in in your particular domain or uh, you know, use of mobile health technologies, ambulatory sensors, uh, and I discussed this area of reach, which is real key in rural health, but also obviously very relevant in the global health context. And so uh, we just had a discussion internally in the NCL leadership about our various technology development support programs, and, and, and those are going to be ongoing. We're going to keep them going. We have some good examples that have been successful, and these uh, really are really focused on how to develop less expensive, uh, sustainable technology uh, that can be used in underserved or global health contexts. And so that continues to be a strong interest of the Institute. Great. So uh, recognizing the time, it looks like we, we uh, do have time for uh, one final question before we'll uh, closing down. Um, a number of the folks uh, who are attending are maybe at earlier stages of their career. And so we're often asked to give advice for early career investigators who are contemplating a career uh, uh, in, in implementation science. So what advice would you uh, give to uh, early career investigators? I think one of the most important things is to get out of your own local institution, build relationships, identify mentors who might not be on your floor of the building, in your department, in your program, at your institution. Uh, we know that implementation science expertise, particularly senior expertise, is still limited in number. So we often hear from junior investigators, gee, I don't have anybody in my own institution that can be a mentor on a K award application or can be a consultant on my first grant application or can help me design my study. Uh, so we're, we're happy to help with that, but I, but I think be, be ready, be prepared to reach beyond your immediate organizational boundaries. Uh, the expertise may be in another part of campus, in another department, uh, or, or in another institution. Uh, one of the best things I did when I was submitting my first uh, grant application to NIH is I cold called, uh, in this case, a very senior health psychologist, Howard Leventhal, and just said, you don't know me, I'm a junior investigator, I'm a nobody, I'm scum, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm submitting my first grant, and I'm using some of your you know, theoretical model referencing some of your work, uh, would you be willing to review the draft of my grant proposal? Would you be willing to serve as a consultant on my grant application? Uh, this was going into NIMH, and he said, uh, absolutely. And um, so, you know, I said, so you, you, don't, you never know until you ask, and I think a lot of times junior investigators are reluctant to ask well-known senior people for help, and if they don't have time, they can give you a name of a, uh, an associate professor who can help, or a colleague, or whatever. Uh, so don't let don't let the lack of limited expertise or the absence of mentors in your immediate environment be a constraint. Uh, you know, go to meetings if you can, network, and uh, you know, senior investigators they like to talk about their own work. They like to talk about what they do. And if you're interested, if you're passionate about what you do, uh, you will find uh, senior effective mentors who can really, really help you uh, navigate the system. Yeah, and, and uh, we'd like to think, uh, and, and we've certainly worked hard to try and make sure that investigators in this particular field, and, and we recognize, ha have been incredibly generous with their time, and whether it's been at meetings or, or through the cold calls that, that Bob described or emails. And, and, you know, sometimes it takes a little perseverance because people are quite busy. Um, but we found that, you know, don't expect that, you, that, that uh, you know, you're going to get a no or that you shouldn't uh, inquire uh, to see if you might be able to, to foster that new connection. Uh, we would also say, of course, that, you know, you, you should always feel free to contact those of us 
uh, at NCI, those of us within our division, those of us within our team, um, there's, that, that's what we're all here for, right? We're here to try and make it as easy as possible to get to do the wonderful work that you're doing um, to, to actually make it happen. And so we'd always encourage you to, to call us um, and to, to, to contact us whenever we can help either match make or, or answer the questions that you have. Yeah, that was, that was another type of invariable advice I got early on, fortunately. And that was, oh, you know, you can contact a program director at NIH. And I was like, oh, really? Won't they be annoyed? Won't they, you know? Uh, and uh, in fact, one of the things I did, was, which was, uh, I'm, I'm getting glad I did it, but I got advice when I was in Seattle and I wanted to expand the research I was doing related to genomics and genetic testing. And somebody said to me, why don't you just buy a plane ticket, fly to, Beth you know, go to Bethesda and set up a meeting in person to meet with the relevant program director who runs that program, the Genome Institute. It's like, you can do that? <laughs> like, yeah, why not? You're a taxpayer. And so I, so I, that's what I did. I got on the plane, came my very first visit to NIH, met with the program director, and, you know, in a, in a 45 minute meeting, it was like 10 years worth of information uh, that I didn't have. Uh, so uh, utilize us, all of our colleagues here. Uh, we're here for you. Uh, your taxpayers pay our salaries, so uh, let us know how we could help. Great. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, thank Bob for, for sharing the love uh, with all of us on this uh, Valentine's Day. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Uh, I'll turn it over to Sarah to close things out. And so I'm also going to thank David and Bob for their time and insights. And as a reminder to you all, your feedback is very important to us. We encourage you to complete the online survey of today's session. That will pop up once we close down our meeting. Um, an archive of today's session, as mentioned, will be available in about a week's time on our website, and we hope that you can join us next month for the next in a series of these that will be focused on our behavioral health research program. Um, and with that, thank you so much. You may disconnect at this time.